I'll try to keep this going, conscious that everyone would rather have coffee than listen to me talk. So um, what I'm going to be doing is building upon some things that we talked about this morning, uh, one of them being uh, Simon and Susie and Hugh and others talking about the end manager model and some of the simulations in Rotorua. Uh, coupling that with some work that uh, I at Landcare uh, and others have been doing on uh, catchment modeling on uh, climate change and uh, water quality policy impacts on two, catch two other catchments, um, one the Hiranui and Waio in North Canterbury and also one in Manawatu. Um, so this is going to be kind of combined uh, talk of that. In addition to that too, Mike Barton talked about uh, how some of the drivers of their management decisions were driven also by a carbon price in the carbon market. And so that's kind of another uh, important uh, point of this talk. So I'm looking at basically the, the potential synergies or lack thereof of uh, having not only uh, a water uh, nutrient trading scheme, but also the, uh, the uh, emissions trading scheme on, on agriculture that uh, will be piled on top of the current forestry ETS that we have. All right, so motivation we know. Uh, pressures to increase productivity, but at the same time that increases outputs and emissions. That's why we're all here. Uh, so there's a national level emissions trading scheme uh, that will basically essentially put a price on greenhouse gases. It's in most of the major uh, sectors of the economy already. Agriculture will be coming in 2015. Uh, and then we're also talking about water policies targeted at a regional scale. And this is basically not only uh, nutrient reduction, but increased irrigation uh, that we touched upon a little bit. Uh, motivation, so there's several approaches to improving water quality. Uh, we've talked this best management practices, catchment level, nutrient trapping, cattle, cap and trade, there's also tax on agricultural inputs uh, or outputs. Um, and so what I'm doing here is looking basically at uh, a couple of agroeconomic models used to estimate policy impacts on three uh, catchments, Hornui Waiau, Manawatu, and Rotorua. Uh, and I'll look at kind of three illustrative policies. Uh, one is just an agricultural ETS, puts a price of $25 per ton on all CO2 emissions from land-based uh, enterprises. Uh, two is a nutrient, uh, nutrient catchment-wide nutrient cap and trade policy that we've been talking about extensively here. Um, and three is uh, basically if you have both policies going on in the, in the same catchment at the same time. Uh, just to get a little context, uh, greenhouse gases uh, are s been steadily increasing in New Zealand, um, kind of peaked right around the time of the global financial crisis. And right now, pretty much the majority of all our emissions come from either energy or agriculture are indicated in here. So, um, but at the same time, we also have a lot of trees and natural vegetation out there that uh, is, uh, has the ability to sequester carbon. So agriculture and energy are the major emitters, but land use, land use change in forestry also allows us to sequester a lot of that carbon. So the other, the other question that, that we have over time with this kind of intensity of land use uh, and the, maybe the drivers of land use change towards um, more pastoral enterprises and things like that is that that can essentially maybe reduce this button, uh, this section over here. Well, at the same time, policies such as the agricultural ETS, nutrient trading, et cetera, might actually have the potential to stretch as far, significantly farther to the left, therefore reducing our overall net emissions. Uh, and this is just afforestation over the last uh, 90 years. So you can see there's peaks and troughs over time. Uh, Right around 2008, 2007, there was barely no afforestation because everyone was waiting for the ETS uh, to come into play. Um, and so it's kind of to be continued again about whether how far up this will go or whether it'll remain relatively flat over time. Uh, and then this is the idea that basically these are these are our net emissions, but if you account, uh, these are our uh, emissions mostly again from agriculture and energy. But if we count for the sequestration from land use, land use change in forestry, we can reduce obligation by about uh, 30% or so. Okay, now to the environmental policy analysis. So uh, what we wanna do is estimate catchment level impacts of imposing uh, the ETS and or nutrient reduction policy on agricultural production. And so we're looking at this with three different catchments. So the first two is Hernui and uh, Waiau and Manawatu. And that's gonna be done with, uh, the assessment was done with Landcare's New Zealand Forestry and Agriculture Regional Model, uh, short for uh, is NZ Farm. Uh, and the other one is the Rotorua Lake um, example that uh, we touched upon earlier. It's similar, the nutrient uh, policy is the same policy that was discussed this morning, uh, but then we're also looking at uh, how end manager can also look at uh, changes in greenhouse gases from a 
price on emissions. So first line policy scenario, um, the baseline basically looks at, assumes the kind of a status quo with no agricultural ETS and no uh, nutrient constraints. So this is how we can measure all the environmental and economic impacts based on a, uh, a model baseline. With the ag ETS, basically we look at just a, a price of $25 per ton of CO2 emissions uh, on the agricultural sector. And at the same time, if people enter into um, forestry carbon sequestration program, they can get paid $25 per ton of CO2 sequestered on top of their business as usual practices. Uh, for the nutrient policy, we actually uh, differ this over the three uh, different catchments. Rotorua, basically what they found is that to meet that cap of the 430 uh, tons or so, you need to reduce, basically you need to reduce nutrient exports to by 60% or 40% below baseline levels. Uh, I'm using an illustrative um, example for Huronui and Manawatu that's similar to Taupo, which is essentially saying let's let's reduce it by 20% over baseline. Um, so this isn't necessarily what's come out of um, you know, any, any suggestions by ECAN or necessarily the one plan, but it is an illustrative scenario to look at. Uh, and finally, let's look at the combination of both. So it's agricultural ETS plus nutrients, so $25 per ton on all emissions, and at the same time, you have to meet these nutrient reductions. Uh, so Manawatu catchment, uh, this is the, the farm types. It's mostly sheep and beef and a bit of dairy, uh, and then some natural uh, dock land on the hills. Uh, Huronuri Wao, uh, again, this is an extensive hill country, so it's sheep and beef and natural. And then this is the kind of the plains area that's uh, more irrigated, uh, more intensive levels of production. Uh, and then Rotorua we've talked about before. And this is the distribution of land use there. All right, so going straight to the model, this is everything is in basically an economic impact relative to the baseline case, and everything's kind of in percentage changes. So the idea in Rotorua is if you have ag ETS, basically you're going to reduce, um, basically this is the cost of the policy will reduce overall, uh, essentially income, or be the mitigation cost will reduce income in the catchment by about 10%. Uh, nutrients, the cost is going to lead to about 35% reduction, and then with uh, the ag ETS plus nutrients, this is accounting for the fact, and then Simon and Susie can help explain this a little better, but it's actually less than this single policy because we're only looking at the cost and not necessarily the trade-off of the nitrogen permits, which essentially some people can have value uh, as well. Uh, and then looking at Hernui, Wao, and Manawatu, what we're seeing is basically the nutrient reduction plans of only 20% are significantly lower in cost than the, the ag ETS. Um, and also, if you basically have the ag ETS and then just add a nutrient policy on top of that, the difference in costs are relatively small. So what it's saying is potentially there might not be a lot of at least cost to the landowner um, for having to uh, pile both, both um, policies on top of each other. Uh, at the same time, it's showing that at least for a 20% reduction, there's a significant amount of mitigation options available um, on, you know, with, with on, on in the catchments so that there's only a one to 5% reduction in overall, um, in overall uh, income. Uh, looking at greenhouse gases, basically all the different policies reduce greenhouse gases regardless of whether it's a nutrient, pol nutrient uh, cap or an ETS. Um, what's interesting again is that in, th in this case, the $25 per ton and 20% uh, reduction in Huronui Wow produces almost the same amount of reductions in greenhouse gases but obviously one is not, that's not the direct target. Um, and then again, as you can see, Rotorua, uh, the nutrient reduction plan, uh, because you have to reduce nutrients by 60%, that's uh, changing a lot of land use and essentially um, reducing greenhouse gases significantly. Um, and then obviously an ag ETS plus nutrients always reduces greenhouse gases by at least more than the nutrient case, but not necessarily in the ag ETS case. And the in Manoa too. And the reason for that is, um, firstly, looking at nutrients, this is all changes in end leaching. So this is nitrogen exports. We're seeing a reduction on every single case except for Manoa too, with an ag ETS only. And so what we're seeing, what's happening in Manoa too, is actually this, you're going from baseline land use to an extensive increase in arable land based on relative profitability. So what it's saying is essentially that you're basically as a farmer, you're willing to ship switch out of sheep and beef to arable land, but what that is is arable land like maize is highly, uh, has high levels of nutrient leaching uh, like for maize. So what that's doing is essentially you're reducing your overall greenhouse gases, but 
because leaching is so much higher for switching from sheep and beef to maize, you're actually increasing your overall nutrients significantly. So it's kind of a pervert, uh, kind of a uh, interesting insight to saying that if you're only targeting one specific policy, you might actually lead to uh, uh, relatively higher leaching levels. Um, absent of thinking about that case still, um, it's shown. But interesting in the other two catchments, we basically found that uh, regardless of the policy, you could see reductions in nutrient. Uh, in nutrient export. So again, one thing, it kind of depends, one thing when you're considering these policies or looking at the effects of an ETS is you have to think about what are the current land uses or the potential land uses in any given catchment. You can't simply just make the conclusion that an environmental policy targeted at one pollutant is, is gonna result in net benefits for all, you know, all the major pollutants in, in the region. Uh, and then, then this is kind of wrapping up, looking at land use. So you can see at Manawa II, there's a significant shift from sheep and beef to kind of a, kind of a much more distributed pie, uh, mostly going to arable extension forest and then some kind of other pasture and scrub, which is essentially more abandoned land. Nutrients, basically because you're capping uh, the nutrients that are coming, uh, that high end leaching coming from arable land, the pie goes back to very similar to what it was. And as a center, basically uh, increasing a little more forest, staying more in sheep and beef. Uh, and actually changing some of your management practices instead. And finally, with the Ag ETS plus nutrients, still relatively little amount of arable, uh, otherwise pieces of the pie are relatively similar to what they were for the Ag ETS standalone. Uh, in Hurunui, where you're seeing essentially is, again, as you move across the different policies, you plant more, uh, basically you expand your forests uh, and reduce your sheep and beef. Uh, dairy is also getting reduced uh, as well, so that's pretty intuitive. Uh, and this is the Rotorua case. Remember that in the, um, basically in the reduction plan here, you had to make the 60% reduction. So what that's doing is essentially what Susie and Simon and others said this morning is that you basically need to switch out from sheep and beef and dairy to a lot of forestry. And it's showing nutrient plus greenhouse grass regulation is one, you have to meet that cap by switching into forestry. And two, because the greenhouse gas tax is essentially, or the greenhouse gas price is essentially make it even more costly to stick in sheep and beef, but s s essentially subsidizing forestry planting even more that the relative difference in profits, uh, profits are really pushing towards planting more trees. All right, so in summary, so analysis shows there may or may not be a win-win scenario for reduction in greenhouse gases and nutrients when just looking at the standalone policy. This was specifically the case when you looked at uh, just the ETS and not thinking about uh, nutrients uh, in conjunction. Economic and environmental impacts kind of vary by catchment. So the $25 per ton had consistent reductions in greenhouse gases across catchments. Um, and then nutrients had wider range of impacts because of the stringency of the policy, such as Rotorua, and then also the mitigation options available. Uh, of course, the caveat is these estimates are driven by enterprise and mitigation options in the model. So uh, end manager has a different set of mitigation options and a different set of land uses than MZ Farm. Uh, on top of that, the catchments are quite different in terms of what you can physically produce there and how they operate. So again, um, you know, as we talked about earlier, is there one model that can solve this kind of the problem for all of New Zealand? Uh, well, not necessarily, because again, the issue is heterogeneity and um, you know, the underlying structures of the model are, 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 are perfectly workable, but you, know, you need to really have a good understanding of what, what the kind of dynamics of the catchment are before you can make these kind of policy conclusions. Uh, and then some other interesting things that uh, for you to talk about later if you see me is that I haven't discussed here. So uh, we've also done assessment of uh, increases in irrigation and left unregulated additional irrigation to Hurunui could lead to more greenhouse gases and nutrient emissions from intensity. So it's something else to consider when looking at the national policy statement for freshwater management. You might not be able to meet objective A1 and B1 at the same time without again additional regulation. And then the allocation and nutrient allowances can have a large effect on policy impacts. Um, we've already talked about some of the allocations. So, all right, thank you.